Yugoslavia's breakup is often overshadowed by the breakup of the Soviet Union or the protests in the People's Republic of China. Yet its effects can still be seen in Europe today. From the poverty suffered by those living in that region to the gap in the European Union. Yugoslavia was described by its own president as one country with two alphabets, three languages, four religions, five nationalities, six republics, surrounded by seven neighbors, with eight ethnic minorities. And in this video, we will talk about how and why Yugoslavia had been divided. But before we can talk about how it fell apart, we need to talk about how the country was created. Yugoslavia started out as an idea. For centuries, this region of the world had been ruled by foreign powers, mostly the Ottoman Empire and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. But most of the people who lived here were neither Austrian, Hungarian or Ottoman. They were Slavic. And Slavs saw themselves as a distinct ethnicity with its own culture, history and traditions. And so Yugoslavia was the idea of a unified state inhabited by Slavic people and ruled by Slavic people. And this idea came around the same time countries like Germany and Italy unified into distinct countries. With that unification also, in part, based around the idea that Italians and Germans each had their own unique ethnic identity. But there was a problem with this Yugoslav idea. While Serbia and Montenegro had gained independence from the Ottoman Empire in 1878, most of what would become Yugoslavia was still under Austro-Hungarian rule. And the Austro-Hungarian Empire wasn't going to give up a large part of its territory just so the Slavs could have their own nation right across its border. But then, World War I happened. And in World War I, Serbia and Montenegro were occupied by the Austro-Hungarian Empire and their governments fled to allied countries. And there, in 1917, leaders of Montenegro, Serbia and representatives from the Austro-Hungarian regions of Slovenia, Croatia, Vojvodina and Bosnia-Herzegovina declared that they would join together to form a new nation, a nation they called the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats and Slovenes. This nation was supported by the Allies, who liked the idea of breaking up the Austro-Hungarian Empire into smaller countries. And by the end of World War I, Austria-Hungary started falling apart. There were revolutions in Vienna and Budapest, the capitals of the Austrian and Hungarian parts of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Czechia and Slovakia declared their own independence shortly after, and in the midst of this breakup, the southern territories of the empire declared its own independence. Serbia and Montenegro were liberated, and the three regions joined together to officially form the Kingdom of Slovenes, Croats and Serbs. Over time, a few more territories were added to the kingdom, such as four small Bulgarian territories and the monastery of St. Nuam. In 1929, they decided that the British way of naming their country wasn't very catchy, and they became the Kingdom of Yugoslavia. With Yug, meaning South, and Slavini, meaning Slavs. And so the country was called the Land of the South Slav, the Land of the South Slavs. And they were right to call it Yugoslavia, because South Slavs is too much of a tongue twister. But this kingdom didn't last very long, because in 1941, Hungary, Germany and Italy came to visit for a world war. And while Yugoslavia's army surrendered, its people did not. Instead, Yugoslavia organized the largest resistance of all the occupied nations in Europe. By 1945, the people of Yugoslavia managed to completely kick out the Axis forces from their soil with only minor support from the Allied countries at the very end of the war. Because Yugoslavia was a strong independent country who needed no foreign liberation. The faction which liberated the country was communist. 
So after taking control over the government, they turned Yugoslavia into a socialist nation and called itself the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. They also gave their old flag a one-star review and made that their new flag. The new nation was founded on three basic concepts. Firstly, it recognized various ethnicities within the country as equals through the idea that they all helped to liberate the country from foreign occupation. The second was that the nation's economy would be managed through socialism. And thirdly, that the country was governed as a federation of six equal republics with a large degree of autonomy. These republics were Slovenia, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Serbia, Montenegro, Macedonia and Croatia. Additionally, the regions of Vojvodina and Kosovo were granted autonomy while still being part of the Republic of Serbia. While there were other foundations upon which Yugoslavia was formed, it is these three which were the most important. And it is also these three foundations which would cause the eventual breakup of Yugoslavia. Because the fall of nations rarely has a single cause. Rather, it's a combination of various issues which, together, cause the collapse of nations. And Yugoslavia is no different in this regard. So first, let's talk about the Yugoslav political system. Being a communist country, Yugoslavia was a close friend of the Soviet Union and the Yugoslav government controlled many aspects of the nation. But in 1948, the country politically distanced itself from the Soviet Union after the leaders of the two countries disagreed on what the future relationship between the two nations should be. In the 60s and 70s, the country began reforming its political system by handing over more and more control away from the central government and towards the individual republics. These changes included, among other things, giving the republics and autonomous regions more control over their own economies, giving them more influence in the central government, and giving the individual republics local armed forces which were separate from the national army. But there was one thing which barely changed during this time, the presidency. After World War II, a man named Joseph Bras Tito became president of Yugoslavia and retained the position until his death. He personally controlled a large part of the national government and was an important force in keeping the nation stable. But there is a problem with relying on a single person to run essential aspects of your government rather than relying on an institution. If a king dies, a president loses an election, or a prime minister falls ill, then the position will be filled by somebody else while the institution of monarch, president or prime minister remains. In Yugoslavia, the country relied on a single person, Josip Tito, until he died in 1980 and there was nobody to replace him as president. Instead, the presidency was transformed into a collective presidency. This meant that the six republics and two autonomous regions would each get one-eighth of the presidency and would need to make decisions via a majority. So while before the country relied on a single person to make certain important decisions, it now relied on eight different groups of people ruling eight different regions of the country to make collective decisions. And these eight different regions each had a different vision for the future of Yugoslavia and their place within it. Serbia wanted a stronger federal government, in which they would likely have gotten a disproportionate amount of control. Kosovo wanted more autonomy for itself, such as becoming a seventh republic in Yugoslavia. Slovenia was the most liberal republic and wanted a more liberal Yugoslavia. Slovenia and Croatia were the richest regions of the country and wanted more control over their own economic policies instead of sending money to poorer regions. Bosnia-Herzegovina wanted to become its own independent nation. With all these different political forces, each with different and often opposing political goals, the country became less and less manageable in the 1980s. The second major factor leading to the breakup of Yugoslavia was its economy. While in countries such as China and the Soviet Union, the leadership took decisions based on communist ideals. 
in Yugoslavia, the government tried a lot harder to implement policies which it believed would be an effective means at providing wealth to its own citizens. Often disregarding socialist philosophy if it proved ineffective at achieving that goal. So while China lost millions due to avoidable famines and the USSR through industrialization, Yugoslavia never saw such types of destructive policies in its country. And its economy performed quite well. At first, Yugoslavia was similar to other communist nations where the government controlled large parts of the economy directly. With a central authority dictating how supply chains are managed, how resources are distributed and how businesses are run. But the Yugoslav leadership soon realized it would be more efficient to let people manage their own workspaces as they had greater knowledge and expertise in their fields than distant bureaucrats do. And so Yugoslavia reformed its economy over the coming decades, becoming the most reformed socialist economy in the world at the time. This reformed economy would eventually consist of four main aspects. Market mechanisms, whereby prices are determined by supply and demand. Decentralized decision-making, where businesses would be able to make their own decisions. Social ownership, where employees of a business automatically owned a share of the business they worked at. And workers' self-management, where those employees who owned a share in a business were the ones making the decisions of that business rather than shareholders who bought a part of a company without ever having to have worked at said company. While these are generally quite good economic policies, a healthy supply and demand generally make sure that there are enough products being made and that there is an incentive to find ways to make those products cheaper and better, and businesses owned by employees are generally more profitable than businesses owned by shareholders or the government. But it's the implementation of this system where things went wrong. You see, employees didn't get to directly vote on decisions in the business they worked at. Instead, they were run by so-called management boards. And if you wanted to get on this management board, then you needed the votes of your colleagues. So, how do you get these votes? Well, for many it was to promise higher salaries. And so in the 1980s the salaries of employees went up. And this might seem like a great idea at first. After all, more money for average people instead of some rich CEO. But a business has a limited amount of resources which it needs to manage. And eventually the salaries became so high that businesses were running out of money. So what did the management boards do? Well, many decided they didn't want to lower salaries and instead opted to increase prices. And now, all across Yugoslavia, prices were going up. But think about this for a moment. Your salary was going up, but so were the prices of products, making your wage increase completely useless. This increase in prices is called inflation and many businesses couldn't keep up with inflation and went bankrupt. And so the government decided to step in by providing welfare for the unemployed, giving money to businesses to prevent bankruptcies, and trying to keep the economy from collapsing. At first they had enough money, but then the Cold War came to an end in the late 1980s. Now, why is this important? Well, Yugoslavia sat right between the capitalist West and the communist East. Both sides wanted Yugoslavia to join their side, or at the very least, not join the other side. And they did this by giving Yugoslavia money. This was a common tactic during the Cold War. Give money to countries so they would be on your side, or at least don't join the enemy. But by the late 1980s, the Soviet Union was breaking apart, and the Cold War was coming to an end. As a result, the Soviet Union sent less money to other countries such as Yugoslavia. But if the USSR wasn't sending that much money anymore, there was no reason for Western countries to do the same anymore. And so all of a sudden, Yugoslavia was receiving a lot less money from other countries. So by now the prices were going up, businesses were being mismanaged, and the government didn't have enough money anymore to keep everything under control. 
and so they decided they would simply borrow money to make up for this. The problem with loans is that people will only give you a loan if they believe you will pay those loans back with interest. And as Yugoslavia's economy got worse, that belief was evaporating. Soon people were no longer willing to give Yugoslavia more money. And so, how could Yugoslavia get enough money to stabilize their economy when investors were no longer willing to give them any loans? Well, they went to an organization called the International Monetary Fund, or IMF for short. This is an organization owned by various world governments which, among other things, sell loans to countries. But they were only willing to give a loan to Yugoslavia if the country would reform its economy and government finances in such a way that it could repay this loan. Those reforms included for the government to cut spending, allowing private businesses not run by workers' unions into their economy, and to restructure their property market, as well as various other minor changes. While this is great for a country's ability to repay debt, it also creates large issues for the country as a whole. The Yugoslav government provided a lot of money to people and businesses to avoid poverty and mass bankruptcies. But if the government has to spend less money, they can no longer provide as much support. And changing your economic system is also likely to cause severe economic issues. And this is where the politics were making things difficult because Yugoslavia had six republics and an additional two autonomous regions. It meant that they needed to figure out together how to implement the IMF's demands in order to get that loan. And Yugoslavia had quite a bit of wealth inequality. The average person in Slovenia was eight times richer than the average person living in Kosovo. So while Slovenia was on par with countries such as Israel and Ireland, Kosovo was on par with third world countries such as Sudan or Papua New Guinea. This economic inequality caused quite a bit of strife. Richer regions such as Slovenia and Croatia argued that they had spent the last few decades building up a healthy economy while poorer southern regions such as Kosovo, Bosnia-Herzegovina and Montenegro spent their money on inefficient businesses and prestige projects and that therefore those southern regions should take the brunt of the reforms as they had the weakest economies with the most inefficient governments. While on the other hand, those southern regions argued that Yugoslavia should have a unified approach to the issue with all republics taking equal responsibility no matter how rich or poor that region may be. Suffice to say, Reforms were slow and the economy of Yugoslavia faced a long recession in the 1980s and 90s. And now we get to the third issue that was facing Yugoslavia, ethnic tensions. Yugoslavia had many different ethnic groups living within its border. An ethnic group is a group of people which share a common cultural or national tradition, such as, for example, the Zulu people of Southern Africa, African Americans of the United States, or the Han Chinese of East Asia. Yugoslavia had several officially recognized ethnic groups. They were the Serbs, Slovenes, Croats, Macedonians, Montenegrins, and later recognized Bosnian Muslims as well. And being recognized as an official ethnicity came with certain rights. You were allowed to openly express your religion. You would receive free education in the dominant language of your ethnicity and they were given their own ethnic republic. When the borders of the Yugoslav republics and autonomous regions were drawn after World War II, they closely corresponded to where the different ethnicities lived. But this system failed over time because people tend to move around to other places and by the 1980s the ethnicities were a lot more spread out. At the same time there were ethnicities which weren't officially recognized. A prominent example were the Albanians who lived in Kosovo. They were a larger ethnic group than the Macedonians or Montenegrins, yet weren't recognized as an official ethnic group. And so they often felt like second-class citizens in their own country, resulting in protests in the 1980s which were put down by the military. And by the late 1980s, politicians exploited the ever-growing ethnic tensions for their own gain. 
because in 1989, Serbia got a new leader, a man named Slobodan Milosevic. And under this new leadership, Serbia's government envisioned a greater Serbia. In this new Serbia, the regions with ethnic Serbian majorities would be added to the Serbian Republic. Ethnic Serbs accounted for about one-third of all people living in Yugoslavia, meaning that there were many regions outside of Serbia which had an ethnic Serbian majority. The goal was for Yugoslavia to become a Serbian-controlled country. One of the ways it sought to control Yugoslavia was through the presidency. There were eight seats, one for each of the republics and autonomous regions, but both these autonomous regions were within Serbia. So the first thing it did was to control these two regions and thus control their seats of the presidency. Then it installed a pro-Serbian government in Montenegro, thus controlling four out of the eight seats of the Yugoslav presidency. Therefore, any policy that wasn't explicitly in Serbia's interest wouldn't have the majority vote and therefore no major policies could be passed without the approval of the Serbian Republic. And so by now it's 1990 and Yugoslavia is facing a combination of three issues. The republics and autonomous regions couldn't agree on how to govern the country, its economy was in a recession without clear solutions, and ethnic tensions were being exploited. And so Croatia and Slovenia decided that they did not want to be part of a government controlled by ethnic Serbians, didn't want to pay for the economic crises of other regions, and didn't want to be part of a country whose government couldn't agree on major policy issues. The Yugoslav constitution gave each republic the right to independence if a majority of that republic voted in favour. And so they each held a referendum on independence in 1990, each passed said referendum, and each decided to secede from Yugoslavia on June 25th, 1991. And so the people of Croatia and Slovenia decided that Yugoslavia will be divided. But as often happens when you break up with someone, they might not let you go so easily. And Yugoslavia was no different. Without Croatia and Slovenia, it meant that Serbia had substantial influence over the four of the six remaining republics and autonomous regions. So what did the Serbian government do with this influence? Well, they still wanted to create a greater Serbia, and 12% of Croatia's population were ethnic Serbs. So while Croatia was trying to become independent, Serbia was going to finance a counter-revolution by the ethnic Serbs by trying to convince them that the Croatians would persecute ethnic Serbs living in Croatia. And so, immediately after declaring independence, Serbs started blockading roads and train tracks, Armed Serbs attacked Croatian targets and the Yugoslav army provided air support while invading Croatia. And so the Yugoslav wars began. Slovenia however was a bit further away. While Yugoslavia tried subduing Slovenia, they ended hostilities after only 10 days of fighting when the European community, a precursor of the European Union, helped negotiate a peace treaty. But Croatia was not so lucky and so it managed to use the regional army each of the republics had control over to hold off the Yugoslav army in 1991, even though it lost about a quarter of its territory. And then on September the 8th of that same year, Macedonia, now called North Macedonia, held its own independence referendum, passed it, and seceded from Yugoslavia two and a half weeks later on September the 25th. It managed to remain at peace with Yugoslavia and did not join the Yugoslav wars. So now, three republics had seceded. Things escalated further when Bosnia-Herzegovina held its own referendum, also voted in favour and declared its independence on March 3rd, 1992. But they also had a large Serbian population, so Yugoslav forces invaded the new country while Croatian forces came to support the new country. With only two republics and two autonomous regions left of Yugoslavia, Serbia and Montenegro decided to create their own Yugoslavia, removing the socialist in their name and called itself the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. But from 1992 until 1995, 
Bosnia-Herzegovina and Croatia would be the major battlegrounds of the Yugoslav wars. In these wars, people committed genocide, filled mass graves, and committed a wide range of war crimes for three years. The death toll is estimated to be around 100,000 to 200,000, with another 4 million people becoming refugees. And it's at this point that other countries started to get involved in the Yugoslav wars, particularly the European community. Even early on, it was predicted that the Yugoslav wars would likely bring millions of refugees, something those European countries were not fond of. It might bring naval conflict in a sea shared with Italy, a prominent member of the European community, which wanted to keep the region stable. And it might destabilize more of Europe in a time when Eastern and Central Europe was going through a major social, political and economic change. So the European community at first tried peace negotiations. While this worked with Slovenia, it failed with Croatia and Bosnia-Herzegovina. And so by 1993, they asked NATO for help. And NATO was a military alliance between primarily North American countries and Western European countries at the time. Many countries who were a member of the European community were also a member of NATO. With a resolution from the United Nations, they set up safe havens where civilians would be protected from the war, while also establishing a no-fly zone to prevent the Yugoslav Air Force from bombing Bosnian and Croatian targets. This war eventually ended in 1995, when NATO began bombing Serbian-held positions. Croat and Bosnian forces managed to kick the Serbian troops out of their territories, and Serbia sued for peace. In November 1995, the war came to an end with the Dayton Peace Accords. This peace accord included letting 60,000 NATO troops maintain the peace. Bosnia-Herzegovina would become a federation consisting of a Muslim Croat and Serbian Republic. And Serbia would get to keep Kosovo. Although Kosovo would later declare independence in 2008. But the country still had it completely broken up, because Serbia and Montenegro were still united. But over the next decade, separatism grew in Montenegro after the wars had ended, and decided in 2006 to hold a referendum on Montenegrin independence. With 55% of the votes in favour, Serbia and Montenegro officially became separate countries on June 3rd, 2006. And there was one final matter to address the war crimes. Many countries did not want to let the atrocities go unpunished, and so the United Nations established a tribunal to put various people on trial who were suspected of committing or ordering war crimes. The tribunal was called <sighs> International Tribunal for the Prosecution of Persons Responsible for Serious Violations of International Humanitarian Law Committed in the Territory of the Former Yugoslavia Since 1991. <sighs> or simply the International Criminal Tribunal of the former Yugoslavia. The people indicted ranged from presidents and prime ministers to common soldiers and generals. In total, 161 people were indicted for various types of war crimes, of which 18 were acquitted, 91 were convicted, 13 cases were transferred to the national courts of former Yugoslav countries, 20 indictments were withdrawn, and 17 died before they were sentenced. If you'd like me to do a video on these trials, then you'll need to wait, because one person is currently appealing their conviction. But once that's over, I'll let you guys vote on whether I should cover these trials or not. The last of these hearings occurred in 2007, after which the institution ceased to exist. And this is how Yugoslavia broke apart. If you liked this video then please give it a like and subscribe for more content. Uh, next video will be about North and South Korea and there is a poll on what video I should make after that. Link in the description. I am a bit sick of covering European topics half the time so this time no Europeans allowed.